In what felt like a lifetime ago, I walked into an Acura dealership in 2001. I remember seeing a brand new Integra Type R sitting on the showroom floor and thinking to myself, why would anybody pay a $2,000 dealer markup on a car like this? With all of this time removed, people are paying upwards of $50,000 for a clean example of an Integra Type R. This car's been out for over 25 years, and anyone born after 1995 won't have the slightest inclination of what this car even is. A car designed in the age before there were 50 ECUs that controlled everything from door handles to dome lights. Driving this car again gives me an uneasy feeling. I almost feel like I'm in a state of purgatory. It brings up the past, the days, weeks, and years that went by that I can't remember what I did. It reminds me that the past is in the past and that you can't go back in time and change things. Cars like this are never coming back. They're gone. They're ghosts. What made the Integra Type R so special was the moment you turned the key, everything came alive. You could feel it in the steering wheel. You could feel it in the shift knob. You could feel it everywhere. It was an experience, and it was an experience that no other car at that time in that price segment had. It didn't have to be everything to everybody like the new Civic Type R. It is an incredibly raw experience. It has no nannies. It has no electronics. It's just you, a steering wheel, a throttle pedal, a brake pedal, and a clutch. Many people talk about the connectedness of Honda products of this generation. In the early 90s, the Integra DC2 was released, but prior to this, Honda was at the pinnacle of motorsports, supplying engines to McLaren in F1, where they won multiple championships with Ayrton Senna behind the wheel. The mindset at this time in this generation product was high revving, naturally aspirated engines, something that Honda was uniquely qualified to do. They were developing a supercar, the NSX. Shigeru Yuhara, who also helped work on the S2000, and the Integra Type R was vital in gathering data, working on the NSX, evolving it, and then building out a Type R version of that, which set the stage for the Integra Type R. Now was the perfect time for Honda. They still had access to all the motorsports individuals, the drivers, the teams that worked on the NSX and the NSX Type R. They could take the Integra and turn it into an edgy front wheel drive experience that was for a driver, that gave you some connection, some spirit, some feeling of that raciness from having a high revving engine. But the big thing was, it wasn't a poster on your wall it was something that most people could afford.
driving this Integra is an event. It's the way that they paired the engine and transmission, set up the chassis and suspension to transmit so much frequency and vibration into that cabin space. You feel alive, you feel at one with the car. Now the Integra was still a street car. It was an evolution of products from the 80s, like the CRX. It shared many components with the Civic. So they had a lot of work to take this from that to something that had this motorsports feel. Now to create this experience in an Integra, they had to make some mechanical and engineering changes, starting with the body. They had to reduce the center of gravity. They have lowered it by 15 millimeters. They have also shaved off 93 pounds. One of the most difficult things to do to a front wheel drive car to make it feel like a sports car is to eliminate understeer. So the first thing was adding a torque sensing limited slip differential, very similar to modern day Torsons with the exception they used helical gears in this LSD. The next thing that the Integra has baked in from the start is it has equal length half shafts, which also help to reduce the understeer effect. The entire car is double wishbone suspension. They did change compliance bushings in the lower control arms to help tow out the front tire under compression. In most typical performance applications, they've also improved or increased the size of the front and the rear sway bars, including lower ball joint or ball joint style end links on the sway bars themselves. They also did work on the frontal area of the car along with the rear wing. They reduced the front lift or the lift of the vehicle by roughly 30%. The wheels went to lightweight aluminum. The braking system was altered, including ABS tuning. The other part of this is stiffening up the shock absorbers. The front dampers had their compression rates increased by 115%, rebound 70, and they switched to a hard rubber shock mount. Now in all of their track testing, if you've ever driven a 90s Honda product, typically all of them are very soft. There's a ton of wheel travel. So to control that in the Integra was important. And they did that by increasing spring rates in the front by 20%. They've also increased the spring rates in the back and switched to a progressively wound coil. With that said, the museum car that we drove definitely has some years on it. And that compression damping is the thing that you notice the most on the street. It is very rough over sudden impacts or speed bump type impacts into the shock. You feel it through the entire body of the car, something you didn't feel on the Integra GSR. Now you can make all the changes to suspension you want, but you have to improve the body structure. And in a 90s car like this, they also address that. They added support bars in the rear subframe, the rear hatch area, the aluminum strut tower bar in the front or shock tower bar. There's also reinforcements in the rear gusset and rear wheel arch among other places. The transmission was a carryover from the Integra GSR, with the addition of a few things. They improved the internal bearings, they changed out the flywheel, they upgraded the clutch, and the feel of the transmission engagement is supposed to be close to that of how the NSX shifts. Now, since this is a track car, they had to make other improvements. They switched to an aluminum engine stiffener, which makes the connection from the engine case to the trans case more rigid, but it also has the byproduct of reducing vibrations up to 22%. The Integra Type R might be best known for its engine design, and while it is in the same B18 family as vehicles like the GSR, there have been some big improvements. They switched to a forged balance crankshaft. They're using a crystal coating on their bearings, which they borrowed from their Formula One engines. This helps to keep oil film consistent on all the bearing material at high RPM. They've also made changes to the pistons, one for cooling, the other to allow for a deeper valve seat for the head design changes. The connecting rods were also matched and balanced. Most importantly was the head work. They port and polished the intake side near the valve seats to improve airflow. They also reduced the weight of the intake valves by 20%, which allowed them the flexibility to raise the RPM by 200. Now to raise the RPM, they also had to change the valve springs on the intake side to an oval design. They were much stronger. This allowed them to use a different cam with a much more aggressive high RPM profile. 
the VTAC crossover point went to 5700 RPM. These changes to that system allowed them to extend the lift and duration of the valve train. Now to match all of the changes in the head work, they've had to improve airflow. They changed the intake manifold and of course made some adjustments to the intake side or the air box. The exhaust system was also reworked, including the header, which improved airflow by roughly 30%. They also made changes to the oiling system. With the redesigned pistons, they dropped internal temperatures. The B18 also got oil jet bolts, and the Type R got an oil cooler that was affixed to the block. During this time, the Integra Type R made some of the most horsepower per liter of any naturally aspirated engine in the world. And they also did it reliably, which makes sense on why it was favored so much in the racing world. Hi, I'm Scott Zellner, owner of King Motorsports. We have been racing Honda since 1981. We had won championships from 81 through 88 with CRXs. That was our mainstay. We raced the CRX all the way through the mid 90s. When the Integra Type R was introduced in Japan in 95 and then brought over here in 97, that became our platform for racing from that point forward. And it's really what made this company. We were super successful with the CRX, uh, but the Integra Type R going world challenge racing, going uh, endurance racing, uh, solo, this, this car won championships in every single facet of road racing in, in the United States and also autocrossing. We provided parts to many of the pro teams. We had our own pro team running in Grand Am. Um, we won the very first championship uh, for King Motorsports in endurance racing in 2001 with this car. We raced them for three or four years until the RSX came on board. But this car is truly our favorite car that we've ever raced. The car sitting behind me has been part of our history for many, many years. The customer came to us in the early 2000s. He had just gotten the car. He was excited about all the Mugen parts that were available for it. He actually drove here from Nebraska and slept in our showroom while we built his car over a series of days. Uh, since then, as time progressed and we learned more about these cars, he's just kind of let us run wild with it. And now, as it sits, it's a two liter VTEC making 250 horsepower at the wheels. Uh, he tracks it regularly uh, and it's just a fantastic car. Is it the fastest car out there? It's not, but it's guaranteed to be one of the most fun cars on the track at any one given time. six or seven years old when the 2001 was even being built. So my idea of a hot hatchback or a fast economy car is like a Mark V GTI. <laughs> and not till I got into this thing for a track session did I realize that you were 100% right. This car is unbelievable. Yeah, this is probably, and I shit you not, one of the best driving cars I've ever been in, at least the best front wheel drive example I've ever been in, in terms of a driving experience. And I'm just gonna start tearing it up here so you can kind of experience what this sounds like. I've ever driven before and you combine the fact that you have a 
manual transmission that is so enjoyable to use. It feels so mechanical. The engine has a sound to it. You have to wind it out. I mean, it is essentially as perfect as you can make a car that you could drive on the street. Pass Porsches on the track. Get that thing out of here. <laughs> it's funny. 9,500 RPM jack. It's funny. It doesn't matter who I've talked to. Well, even our Porsche rep, who is a big car guy, but a European car guy, was infinitely jealous that we had one of these to be driving. <laughs> Everyone I talked to who's of a, let's call it, a certain age is, you know, has such fond opinions or memories of this thing, and it's clear, yes, this is a highly modified variant that Scott talked about, but all of the great dynamics in the base car that you and I both got to pound around carry over to this and have just been <laughs> so massively improved. It's funny, I mean, it doesn't feel like a rear-wheel drive car, but it rotates like a rear-wheel drive car. It's, it's unbelievable. I just, I can't say enough positive about this thing. Yeah, I'm in awe driving this car, man. It's just, it's like exactly what I pictured as a kid watching those best motoring videos where they're driving those cars with spoon engines at 10,000 RPMs just going flat out loafers. <laughs> That's exactly what this is for me. Now I know why so many people were so excited by this car when it came out. But sadly, you know, at the time, I think it was underappreciated. And now getting it out here, if they came out with something similar to this again, be on another planet. You couldn't, they couldn't sell, they couldn't build enough of these to sell this car. I think a part of it, what makes this car so special is this formula's going away. They were still making cars like this. This would still be amazing, but this you wouldn't have the longing for an older vehicle like this or be willing to pay the sixty, seventy thousand dollars for a clean one. The fact that no modern enthusiast for an all drive car has this noise, this level of connectedness is why this is such a special experience. It's not hard to predict the future of cars. We're already here, but there is hope. We know a car like the DC2 Integra Type R is never coming back for its price point. But Acura is rebooting the Integra name in the United States after 20 years. But the beauty of the car, the DC2, was it gave you this high-strung, connected driver's car feel that is now sadly only available in cars well over $70,000. You have to pay so much money to get a vehicle with this much spirit. And that is exactly what the Acura products of old and some of the Honda products of old had going for them. And why now people are paying insane prices to acquire vehicles like this. This car embodies its designers and the era in which it was created. But like most things in life, there's always an end. Thank you.